Hello, my first guest today is Dr. Jean-Claude Burgelman, expert on scientific information, research and innovation, and the head of unit, science policy, foresight, and data at the European Commission. Welcome, Dr. Burgelman. Welcome. Uh, recently, there's been lots of discussions about open science, science 2.0, uh, and the so-called new paradigm shift in sciences. Do you believe that we are truly entering a new era of scientific history? If so, what would be its main features? Well, okay, it's, it's not so much a matter of belief, it's a matter of facts. Uh, if you look at what is happening in the scientific world and in how research is done, how uh, publications are being pub pushed in the open, how people collaborate, via all kind of open models, how uh, new initiatives like repositories for data, repositories for preprint, repositories for all kind of stuff uh, are, are being developed. If you put all that together, you see a picture emerging whereby the traditional way of doing research is being, is changing. Mm -hmm. And it's not changing uh, marginally, it's changing fundamentally. So. You can only speak of a paradigm shift because that's, how, that's what we say in, 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 in Brussels. You can only speak from a paradigm shift from science to open science or from science 1.0 to 2.0 because what you see happening is systematic. It's not because it's one element. It's not only open access. It's, it's not only open data. It's because you have the whole chain of science uh, from, from uh, investigating, from having your question, finding your data, publishing it, get your feedback. You see that chain is completely under, cha under, under, under transformation towards a much more open um, environment. And because of that, because it is a systematic change, I do believe, to come back to your question, that indeed this is uh, something that is happening now. And it is also something that is happening and that is irreversible. Also because it's part of what is happening in our societies. Uh, it, if you look at if you look at the open source software, which is actually a totally new way of making so, uh, software, which is, which is working. Uh, if you look at open innovation, which is also the same development in the innovation policies as what you see in science policies. If you see all that, uh, it's part of, of, the, of, of a changing way of doing business, of a changing way of, uh, of uh, articulating uh, human relations and so on. Uh, social relations, sorry, and, and that, that leads us to believe that we are facing a, a, a paradigm shift which is happening now. Now, what is the essence of it? The essence of it is that what you go from a closed system where only X amount of people collaborate in a certain fixed way, you go to an open system which changes the practices of researchers, publishers, universities, funders, etc. So that is the, that's the starting point. How far this goes, because this is implicit in your question, how deep this will go, this is, this is speculation. I have my own opinion on this, uh, and, and you can only guess because no one, as you know, can, f can foresee the future. But, but if, you, if you reason by, by, uh, by extrapolation, or if you reason by looking back at similar changes in the past, you, you can easily think that in 10 years' time, the, 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 the science and research landscape and the way we, the main stakeholders uh, behave in that has, has changed uh, radically. This doesn't mean, and then I close, this doesn't mean that the fundamentals of science are changing. We will always have empirical research. We will always have um, a peer review uh, as, as the basis of, of, of uh, determining what, what quality is. We will always have professors, we will always have libraries, but the, the way you do it, the way you organize the peer review, the way you teach, the way you do research, that will change, but not, of course, the fundamentals of science, which, which is, in essence, uh, that you have a theory, that you have a question following a certain theory, you look for the data to prove your question, and you adjust your theory, and then the circle starts again. That, of course, is not changing. Yeah? The fundamentals stay the same, but the way you do it changes. And as a result of that, the whole system changes. But isn't there a danger that this new science might soon uh, become a sort of a dehumanized enterprise? What I mean, with the advent of big data, uh, explanation is, is gradually being replaced 
with, with correlation. And uh, isn't it the end of, of true understanding? There are several questions in your, in your statement there. Uh, first of all, co correlation doesn't mean causation. That, that was, they teach you that in, in the first year statistics at university. It's what it was so in the old days of pen and paper. It's not because two series happen at the same time that there is, they correlate, but there is no causation. It, it's, it's the same for big data. What does change, of course, is that you can correlate now everything with everything because you have data on everything, which means we must, as universities, as academics, we must put much more attention in the future on teaching our students and our researchers that correlation is not causation. So we have to, actually, we have to go back to our basics of, of what, what the scientific method is all about, much more than before. And that's, in, in essence, a good thing. So that's one part of your question. Secondly, uh, will it dehumanize? I, I, I don't see it that way because it, in a certain sense it is what open science and big data allows you to do is to make a much more and a much better use of your investment time and money wise in science because by opening up your data you make it reproducible. By collaborating in the open you, you imply much more people. So it is a different way of doing it. It doesn't mean dehumanizing or not. But <coughs> what I think is very important is, is, is indeed in the future, given the fact that we will have data on everything, if, if in 20 years time everything has a chip, including our own body, you will have a data point on everything. So meaning you can collect empirical data on everything, so to speak. In that means, whereas in, in whereas 50 years ago a lot of our research questions were determined by the fact can we find the data that will be less less pertinent so you will you will be able to do much more which is a good thing but it also means that we must teach people to think critically it's not because you have data that you have a problem it's not because that there are data on X and you can correlate them to come back to your, to, to your last question. It's not because you can correlate something that you are doing something significant. So critical thinking, epistemology, the, the value of sources, the value of data will have to become standard courses in universities because this is our new tool. Just like you are teaching in university the value of your observations, how, where are the distortions, or if you go to history, the value of your sources. So this, is, this has always been part of our curriculum, but in the future it will only increase because of this explosion of data. Uh, so let's talk now about uh, European Commission policy. Uh, European Commission strongly supports openness in science, and it recommends member states that they implement appropriate policies on both open access and uh, open data. And my question is, how can European Commission enforce the implementation of these recommendations? Well, first of all, I don't think anyone in the Commission wants to enforce this. Uh, we do believe very strongly that if, if this is a systemic change happening, it can only happen and Europe can only take the benefit out of it if, it is, if, if all stakeholders are on board and if we work together on it. And that is a, that's, a, that's an absolute belief that, that we got uh, from all our discussions. We had hundreds of discussions with scientists and stakeholders on what is happening and what to do about it and what will be relevant policy. So our bottom line is th this is not a top-down policy. This is not something to enforce. By the way, in education, you can't enforce anything because it's subsidiarity. It is something we have to work together on it. Uh, systemic changes always go with bumpy roads. And, and you can, the, you know, the best way to get over it is by, by just uh, clinging together and joining forces. So our policies on open access and open data, therefore, are only uh, articulated within the remit which we control, so meaning Horizon 2020, the funding programs of the Commission. It is up to the Member States and of course we use a series of, of instruments and, and, and sensibilization uh, mechanisms to try to get everyone on board. We have monitoring, we have access and so on, but, but 
it is not an enforcement policy, but what we hope to do is that by showing the example, uh, open access for publications in Horizon 2020, that pilot on open access to data uh, also in Horizon 2020, we hope to show there to lead the way, and we hope that the member states will follow. Okay, so let's go back to, to openness in general for a while. Uh, openness in science may have various uh, results. Uh, it may be democratically beneficial, but it also can lead to some sort of segregation into equal and more equal scientists, to paraphrase George Orwell. And it's easy to see when we think, for instance, about open access journals, uh, where article processing charges can reach even a um, couple of thousand pounds per article. And uh, will openness equalize differences or will it deepen inequalities? What's your opinion about this issue? Well, first of all, to take it the, 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 the technical point of your question. So in, in our policy in, in Horizon 2020, whereby we make open access to publications mandatory, uh, we also foresee that the charges can be, uh, can be made eligible on, on the project. So this is inevitable. The cost of the charges is a heated debate. And uh, as you rightly say, this is a point of concern. Will the gold open access, because that's where the charges come from, in the end not lead to a situation which is more expensive than the old system of subscription? That's a very valid question, but to be very honest there, we, 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 are, we are investigating this. We are trying to, to get a better economic grip on this so that we, we talk on facts and not on on impressions. Um, so this is, it's a bit premature to, uh, to, to think that uh, this, is, this is already a big problem now, but it is a problem, it is something serious. Now, in general, will open, openness lead uh, to more uh, inequality or not? That's what you have policy for. It is the purpose of policy to make sure that openness does not lead to a new divide. It is also the purpose of policy to make sure that if we go for open data, that it is done in a way that is to, it is, is to the benefit of Europe, meaning all of Europe and not a few, and idem dito in a global context. So it is a priori openness will more lead to uh, equality because there is much more access, much more opportunity. Uh, if, if there are open data and open publications for those who can't afford it to, to do the same costly uh, publications or, or research. But as you rightly said, so on the long term it might become a new divide. But that is exactly what we should avoid. And that's where we sit together with, with all stakeholders to try to find ways to make it as accessible as possible. Because public research in the end should be, one of the purposes should be that the, the entry level, so to, to participate in public research, should be equal for, for everyone. Open data reuse is truly effective only on a wider scale, uh, in actual fact, optimally on a global scale. And uh, what can be done to improve the compatibility of different uh, legal systems in this regard? What can we do to reduce the, the, the legal barriers uh, across the globe? That's a very difficult question. Not, not intellectually, but uh, politically. Uh, in the ideal world, suppose we would sit on Mars and we have to invent the open access for Mars. For all those living in Mars, it would be relatively easy. You just do one legal system for the whole of Mars. But this is not how Europe is, is working. So. What we are trying to do there is, is twofold. On the one hand, uh, our commissioner is pushing very hard for research-friendly legal provisions with regard to text and data mining, with regard to copyright, with regard to uh, data protection, etc. So our, our part of the commission, uh, and, and as a result the commission, we are pushing very hard to, to, to harmonize or to at least make sure that, that even if it is patchy, that it is not research unfriendly. But as you know, this is something we cannot decide alone. So we have to have all the member states on board. Again, 
that's why I, what I said in the beginning, if, if, if this is not a joint venture, it will not work. Uh, and, and this is not easy. It took, uh, what is it, it took uh, 30 years in Europe to have uh, a European patent system. Uh, we had everyone uh, for the last 15 years was absolutely unanimous that we needed a European patent system, but it still took another 15 years to get it off the ground. So it is not easy. It's, uh, you, you, can, you can deplore it if you sit on Mars and say how, how, how easy it is, but it's a reality. So that is one thing. That's one level of action. Another level of action is, together with the research community, and that is what came out of our discussions, is to try to foresee a system whereby everyone would accept that the use of data for publicly funded research, that that would be taken care of in a secure environment where the level playing field for the whole of Europe is the same, and where if global partners uh, want to take part of it, it would be on the basis of reciprocity, meaning if A wants to take part of the environment, European environment for open data, it means that the European environment for open data should also be able to take on the same conditions part in A's uh, uh, environment. That's the kind of thinking, so at first the, the concrete action is, is politically, the second thing is to try to come up with the research community to a um, a pragmatic solution for it, but that's, these are, this is work in progress, this is not a, a final policy at all. Uh, so my last question would be about uh, open data as a tool to foster innovation. Mm -hmm. That's uh, European Commission point of view, and are you going to measure the impact on, of, of open data in this area? Together with my, 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 uh, my colleagues in Brussels, we are, we are, we are thinking of, of uh, setting up a monitor to measure this kind of thing. Uh, because what you say is very important, you know, you, you need to demonstrate on, on an empirical basis that your policy has effect and impact. To zoom in on your question how to measure that open data leads to more uh, innovation, quite frankly, I don't know it uh, for the moment, but if you know it, uh, send me an email because we will certainly, certainly use it. I, there are different ways, the classical ways to see where, where the, 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 you know, you can, you can scan text and data mining, the literature used for, for, the, for asking for a patent, and then you could, you could trace it back to, uh, to where the data came from. So th there are certainly ways, but there is, as far as I know, there is no comprehensive fixed method uh, to do that, but it is certainly on our table to, uh, to develop. And, and because all this is part of what I would call uh, old, old metrics. Eh? So, so you, you develop new ways to measure scientific activity, not only uh, the, the high impact journals uh, only, but the whole, the whole activity and how your open data lead to more innovation is, is an important new metric of the future. Eh? Dr. Burgelman, thank you very much for your time and for this very interesting talk. Thank you, pleasure. <laughs>